I just don't know where I can go. Fun getting low. Winter is a coming back and colder than the last. Pity for me, cold it can be. When breezes blow with ice and snow, no wonder then I think I'm in a game. Welcome to Sparky on Ice, the coldest podcast on the internet. Today is October 10th, and I've been on ice for 57 days. Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a nice two weeks. I certainly did. As you may remember, last time I was having trouble with the aquarium pumps. Well, it got a bit worse. Not only were my pumps not working, we had one of the town water pumps go out as well. So we had to pull my pumps back out and one of the town pumps. I made a time lapse of the crane pick and the reinstalled pumps and it will be on the YouTube version of this episode. The day we did it started out as an email around 9 a.m. that we needed to do the pumps. We had intended to replace the spare aquarium pump that day, so I expected the email. But when I got to the seawater intake, I found out that the town pump had failed, so we had to pull my other one and the town pump. So we get set up, get the crane in place. The pick went well. We got them out on the trailer so the pump mechanic could work on it. Uh, a little while later, I hear that the pump they wanted to use as a replacement was the wrong size. They wanted to use one of the new ones for the aquarium. Since we couldn't use them this year, that made sense to me. It took them a while, but they got the approval to use them, so they got it hooked up and ready to install. And because we have done so many of these pulls in the past couple weeks, we got all three pumps reinstalled within one hour, which is some sort of record, probably. And once we were sure the pump was working, we started getting our pumps working again and immediately ran into problems. We could not get any power from the contactor. Initially, we thought it was a bad contactor, but it turns out that it wasn't. And it took us another day in going over all the controls when we finally realized it was probably a bad timer. These pumps have a 15 second time delay where if they're not getting 15 gallons per minute, or I'm sorry, 50 gallons per minute, they will shut themselves off. And one of the timers had gone bad, so it wasn't sending a signal telling the contactor to engage. So we weren't getting anything at all. We changed that out and it started up, only to fail again later that night. And we started back at the contactor and realized the thermal overloads were too small. Uh, we do this to protect the motors from burning up. So we went and got bigger ones and it started up and it was running, but I was really concerned about the heat because the contactor was still creating quite a bit of heat. So I went and got an IR thermometer and I wanted to check it just to make sure we didn't miss any loose connections or anything. And I took a temperature reading and found that the contactor internal temp was really, really high, like way, way above what we would expect to see. So I did some math and figured out that the contactor itself was too small. It's a size two and we need a size three. Uh, and what brought this to my mind was a couple of years ago, we had changed that particular pump to a bigger one, and we did not upsize the contactor at the same time. And of course, we didn't have the proper one on station, so the aquarium will just have to work on one pump for this season, and we'll get everything fixed next year, I hope. That seems to be a going trend around this place. Anyway, we're back in yellow again with the main body arrivals last week. The rules are a little bit different this year, but not much. Still have the six foot rules and masks, but they're allowing a little more capacity in the lounges and gyms. Uh, biggest issue this year is going to be the increased population over last year. It is double what we had last year, and the galley said they would probably not be able to serve everyone during scheduled meal times, and there had to be some sort of solution to this. So a plan was created to set up a second serving line in the seating area and have no seating at all during mealtimes. Uh, everything would be takeaway. Problem is there's not enough power available in that area to support the equipment needed to do that. So my team had to scramble and get uh, power over there before the next set of people show up later this week. Uh, and the crew, and which is great because I got two new guys that came in on Wednesday and they stepped up and just went in and took care of that uh, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday this week. It looks like we will be finishing on Monday and the plane is supposed to arrive on Tuesday. So hopefully everything works, but they should. I have faith in these guys. But 
Yellow brings even more challenges, and this year is no exception. They have decided to cut bar hours and raise drink prices. And I tell you, this did not sit well with the community down here. Uh, there was a lot of grumbling and a lot of um, finger pointing at the time as, as to why and who and how. And, oh, well, we happen to go into yellow right after that, so it's not affecting us at the moment. But as soon as we go green and the bars reopen, that's going to cause some more problems. Uh, what I'm mostly concerned about is trivia and karaoke. Since they are shutting down the bars at 10, we lose an hour of time. Trivia can probably be done in about two hours. So if we started it at 7.30 instead of 8, we'll probably get through it. But it'll be really tight. And there's no way I can do karaoke for just two hours or so. We're going to have to start that at 7.30. And hopefully people show up and realize that it's going to be starting earlier. But still, it's going to be tight to get everybody in. I'm used, And with summer coming, I am going to be packed out the gills. People are going to get one, maybe two songs, tops, when they've been used to getting three or four. It's going to be different. Um, I probably won't sing as much, so we'll see how that goes. I might pull out one song in the beginning just to get things started, and then we'll go from there. And the next few weeks are going to be really, really tough. Uh, we're going to have limited contact and almost no recreational opportunities aside from, you know, individual hiking or, you know, individual band. There's just not much to do in groups, which this community really strives on being able to get together in, in a social structure. And it's really hard on us down here because we're already um, giving up so much of our social lives to be down here. It's really, really important that we continue with that social interaction that we, as humans, crave. And yellow really puts a, a real halt to that. It's just really difficult. I'm generally okay with being uh, independent most of the time, but I still crave some of that interaction. So maybe I'll get with Rec when uh, she gets here, the recreational supervisor, and we'll see if we can do something like what we did last year and maybe some galley quizzes or maybe I'll drag the speakers out and we'll have an outside dance party or something. I'm not real sure how we're going to do it, but um, we're going to work on it and see what happens. Maybe, uh, and you know, if some of you have suggestions, maybe drop me a line. Let me know what something you think we could do uh, to make yellow a little more bearable for the next few weeks. And not only will morale be hard, but we will also have so much work to do over the next few weeks. And I'm already short-staffed with no hope of a replacement for the guy that left a couple weeks ago. There's just not, there's no bed space in New Zealand MIQ to get another person through. Not till maybe January, and then it's pretty much too late. But this week, we're going to start setting up Williams Field, our seasonal runway. Last year was not so bad, since we only had to put up the runway lights. But this year, we're putting up the entire town. About 25 buildings and a new landing system. They're going from the uh, MLS, which is microwave landing, to a TLS, which is telemetry landing. So we're upgrading. Nice. Only thing is, we don't really have the manpower to do all of it as quickly as they want. So we're going to do what we can. And the buildings have sat for 18 months now. Uh, and I don't know if you know it, but the snow here gets into everything. And I am pretty sure those buildings are going to be completely full of snow. They usually have snow in them in a normal year and they only sit for six months eight months or something like that it's going to be incredibly difficult to get that snow out of there we have to dig them out and then put a lot of heaters in there and it's just going to be a mess and i also started working at the station store this weekend uh, that's so far it's been fun getting to see and talk to a lot more people will help with my own morale which is one of the reasons i did it um, even if it's only for a minute per person, it's still nice to see other people. At least I'm not stuck in my room, especially since they turned off our Wi-Fi last week. Best part, I get to play my music, and when people ask about the music they're playing, I can tell them it's my mix, and uh, I do DJ on station, so they have an opportunity to have me DJ their parties. Kind of like free advertising. I also received my new dual microphones, so I can start doing some interviews with some of the interesting people on the ice. I would look for that in the next few weeks. Not sure exactly when I'll get that going, but hopefully sometime real soon. Well, 
I guess that's about it for updates this week. Again, sorry for being late. Hopefully I can keep up with a bi-weekly schedule going forward. I guess it depends on what is happening here during the week. But now on to history. So last episode we had left when Shackleton had made it to Elephant Island after his ill-fated expedition had lost their ship and became stranded in Antarctica. So here we go. Their first landing place wasn't ideal by any means, but they soon found a more appropriate place to make camp at a place they called Point Wild, after Frank Wild, who had gone down to the coast to scout. For the, first, for the time being, they were more safe and secure than they had been for a long time, but they were still stranded far from civilization, no one knowing where they were or what their condition was. There was no chance of rescue, no ships passed that way, and no radio at the time was capable of summoning help. Shackleton realized that in order to effect rescue, he was going to have to travel the nearest inhabited place, which was a whaling station back on South Georgia, some 800 miles distant across the most stormy stretch of ocean in the world. They expected to encounter waves that were 50 foot from tip to trough, Cape Horn rollers in a 22 foot long boat. Their navigation was by sextant and chronometer of unknown accuracy. They were dependent on the sightings of the sun that could sometimes not be seen for weeks in an overcast weather so characteristic of these latitudes. Shackleton chose Frank Wilde to stay behind with the men on Elephant Island as he felt that he could hold them together well. If there was no rescue by spring, they were to try and reach Deception Island, which was regularly used by whalers and sealers. The lifeboat chosen for the journey was the James Coward. It was made seaworthy by whatever limited beans were available and equipped with the part cover against the weather and the sea. But launching her was eventful, with many of the men being soaked to the skin a serious matter in the cold climate. It was very limited facilities for drying their clothes and getting warm again. The party left behind on Elephant Island used the two remaining lifeboats to make a hut. They were turned upside down and placed on top of two low stone wall. Tent and sail fabric were used as linings to keep the wind and weather out. The men were even able to make a small celluloid window from an old photograph case. A blubber stove provided heat and was used as a cooker. Conditions were cramped and food was in short supply. One of the party, Black Boro, little more than a boy who had joined on the ship as a stowaway in Buenos Aires when his companion had been hired, though he had not, suffered from frostbitten toes. They were amputated by the surgeons by the meager light given by the blubber stove. The James Card set off on 24th of April 1916, the very last day before the pack closed in again around Elephant Island on a day of relative calm. The crew was Shackleton, Worsley, Crean, McNeish, McCarthy, and Vincent. The anticipated journey time was a month. It was become one of the most astonishing small boat journeys of all time. The James Card made progress at the rate of 60 to 70 miles per day through rough sea conditions. The sea constantly came in and made everything, including the sleeping bags, wet. It was difficult to find any warmth at all. There were four sleeping bags made of reindeer hide, which shed their hairs in the constant dampness, making them less effective and clogging the pump used to empty the seawater that spilled over the boat. The boat was relatively unladed, so boulders and other ballast had been placed aboard in order to trim her. These had to be constantly moved around. The weather worsened, and they encountered fierce storms. As the temperature dropped, ice formed on the outside of the boat from frozen sea spray, up to 15 inches deep on the deck. This made the boat much heavier and affected the trim, more moving around of boulders, and the men also tried as far as they could to chip, to chip away the accumulated ice with any tools that they could improvise, though the situation worsened. They began to throw items overboard in order to save weight. Spare oars went as did two sleeping bags that by now were soaked through and hard and heavy with ice. At other times, they had to bail out water for dear life and only solace during the journey were hot meals every four hours by the light of a Primus stove. They had been drifting for some time under light sail, held back by the sea anchor due to the sea state. A sea anchor is a sort of large canvas bag that acted to slow the boat and prevent it from being tossed around quite so violently during stormy seas. Sea anchor, however, was lost as the boat fell into a large trough between the waves. The men then had to beat the canvas sails free of ice and set them again properly in order to keep on course. Frostbite was beginning to ex affect exposed fingers and hands in the cold, constant wet. Navigation was also a problem due to continually overcast weather. On the seventh day at sea, however, a break in the cloud came and Worsley was able to take a reading from the sun, six days since the last observation. He calculated they had traveled around 380 miles, were almost halfway to South Georgia. A short period of sunshine meant that the men were able to spread their clothing over and other gear 
over the boat deck and masts to dry out. The ice became less dense and they occasionally were accompanied by wildlife, porpoises, and tiny storm petrels. On May 5th, the 11th day out to sea, the sea became much rougher. Shackleton was at the tiller. I called to the other men that the sky was clearing and then a moment later I realized that I had seen was not a rift in the clouds, but a white crest of an enormous wave. During 26 years of experience in the ocean in all its mood, I had not encountered a wave so gigantic, said Shackleton. It was a mighty upheaval of the ocean, a thing quite apart from the big white capped seals that had been our tireless enemies for many days. I shouted, for God's sake, hold on, it's got us. Then came a moment of suspense that seemed drawn out into hours. White surged the foam of the breaking sea around us. We felt our boat lifted and flung forward like a cork in breaking surf. We were in a seething chaos of tortured water. But somehow the boat lifted up, half full of water, sagging to the dead weight and shuddering under the blow. We bailed with the energy of men fighting for life, flinging the water over the sides with every receptacle that came to our hands. And after ten minutes of uncertainty, we felt the boat renew her life beneath us. On May 7th, Worsley again was able to take navigational readings and reckoned they were not more than a hundred miles from the northwest corner of South Georgia. Another two days with the wind with them and they would have the island within their sight. On the morning of the 8th of May, they began seeing kelp floating in the sea and some seabirds. Just after noon, they caught a glimpse of South Georgia. Only 14 days after leaving Elephant Island, about half as long as they thought the journey would take. Landing was less than straightforward affair. Reefs, shallow rocks just below the sea, stretched all along the region of the coast where they were and great waves broke over them. The rocky coast in many places descended steeply into the sea. Despite being so close and running out of fresh water to drink, they had no choice but to wait for the next morning to break before attempting to land on shore. The morning brought a shift in the wind and a terrible storm arose. The James Card was tossed around the sea when light broke. They were out of sight of land once again. They made their way back to South Georgia just after noon, but again the coast of huge breakers and sheer cliffs greeted them. The day wore on and there seemed no hope. Later, though, in the evening, the wind shifted directions and began to die down. By the morning of the 10th of May, there was very little wind and they were able to look for a landing place. Reefs and breaking waves dogged their every attempt. They found a likely bay to land, but were blown out to sea again by a change in the wind. In approaching darkness, they eventually were able to enter a small cove fronted by a reef. They had to take in the oars to pass through, but at long last, carried by the swell, the James Card was able to land on the South Georgia beach at King Hawken Bay. They got through thanks to Shackleton's leadership and incredible navigational skills of New Zealander Frank Worsley. Worsley had only been able to take sightings of the sun four times on April 26, May 3rd, May 4th, and 7th. All the rest had been dead reckoning, keeping on the same straight line in the same heading. Had they failed to land, the boat would have swept onward to be lost in the mid-Atlantic and no rescue party would have been sent out for the men on Elephant Island. That's going to be it for history this week. Next week, the arrival of South Georgia and rescue. If you have any questions, you can contact me on Twitter or Facebook at Sparky on Ice or an email podcast at sparkyonice.xyz. The music used in this podcast is Cold Winter Blues by Lucille Hegeman and the Dixie Daisies and is used under public domain.